All right. What? Who am I? There. That's who I am. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I don't know anymore. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, January 10th, 2014. Today, we are going to be talking about Venus at Inferior Conjunction, all kinds of crazy news from the American Astronomical Society, including uh, gamma ray gravitational lenses, death by a black hole, uh, information about opportunity, a triple, new triple star system. We're going to be talking about oh, frontier fields. So tons of news from uh, from the AAS. And we're going to be talking about the Antares launch, the... Man, what else have we got? Uh, oh, and we've got to wake up Rosetta. So... Joining us this week, we've got Amy Shira Title, returned from the homeland. AKA Canada. AKA Hello. Canada. <laughs> yeah, and you were like literally dodging sheets of ice that were yes. attempting to destroy your house. Yes. Also we known as it. Tuesdays in Canada. Also known as Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ne never has the city been shut down by ice. So fun, fun Christmas when you have no heat and no power and no home. <laughs> and a polar vortex. Yes. Yeah. Brian Coberline. Hey, Brian. Hi. Uh, did you enjoy your polar vortex? It was interesting. Our campus got closed down for one day, the first in five years, because of the cold. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we but got David I Dickinson. spent time in Minnesota, so it's not that big of a deal. And David hey. Dickinson, you were calling yourself a polar vortex refugee. Yes, I'm staying warm here in Florida. Actually, we get down to about zero Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit here in Florida for a few days. I actually had to dig out and find where the jackets were. That was kind of strange. That was a that, <laughs> well. That was a similar situation on on what led up to the events with the Challenger disaster, right? That the temperatures yeah, were yeah, low it in does, Florida. It, you know, you know, people, you can get hypothermia here in Florida. It actually, it's, it sounds strange, but it is possible this time of year. Is that because uh, you're swimming in your speedo and it gets <laughs> too cold? If you, if you go if you go out like some of these special ops guys and stay out in the swamp all night this time of year, you can get hypothermia. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we got Scott Lewis from Nova hey. Cosmos, yeah. and uh, and Scott's been busy all week with the Double AS. You guys were doing live broadcasting live on broadcast. the NASA feed, which I think is a bit of a coup. Yeah, it was it it was crazy. Uh, Tony uh, Tony Darnell from STSI was was down there on the ground. We were trying out new technologies. Some things worked, some things didn't. And then, uh, yeah, it got picked up by NASA TV. It was broadcast there, which was really He cool. was just like a walking broadcast terminal. We, yeah, that's what we did. We used a Live View broadcasting backpack, which is used by a lot of uh, professional journalists. And we were streaming and had a lot of fun. Cool. Really stressful. But uh, we, there was a really lot of good feedback going on. We were able to bring the conference to the rest of the world if they weren't able to show up. And we have a very special guest this week, which is Ruth Beckvinia from the Wake Up Rosetta team. You're in, what, you're in Ireland, I think, right now? I'm Irish, but I'm based in the Netherlands. Oh, you're based in the Netherlands. Man, European yeah. Space Agency, it's all over the place. So, so, what is, so what's going on? You're here to sort of announce that it's time for Rosetta to wake up? Well, we've got 10 days left now before Rosetta wakes up, and it's such an amazing and exciting mission that we're calling on everybody to help us to wake up Rosetta. So we're running a video campaign, which we already had some entries for. Uh, you can see the hashtag on Twitter is Wake Up Rosetta, and we also have a special Facebook page at uh, facebook.com forward slash Rosetta Mission, where you can see all the details of the competition. But essentially, you can do pretty much anything you want to wake up Rosetta, because it's so important that our sleeping beauty, as we've been calling the spacecraft, wakes up after 31 months and uh, goes on its journey to Comet 67P, Churyumov, Gerasimenko. And, uh, can you say that again? <laughs> uh, 67 P. Churium of Gerasimenko. <laughs> Nicely done. You're the only person uh, who can say that. <laughs> and we're really looking forward to a huge year for the mission, but it all starts January 20th with the wake up. So, now why has Rosetta been asleep? So, Rosetta's been asleep because it uh, works off solar panels and it's so far from the sun that it needed to conserve some energy. So, the best way to do that was to put in a hibernation state. But the downside of that is that we haven't been talking to her in a long time. And the mission's done some really lovely stuff already in terms of encounters with asteroids and sending beautiful pictures from the flybys of Earth and Mars. But this is the big year. And, you know, it's so exciting looking back to a launch in March of 2004 
to the culmination of a mission 10 years later, um, there's so many things to in inspire people about the mission and even the videos we've had so far to wake up Rosetta just echo so much of that. People are really excited. And uh, how many times has, has she pushed the sleeper, sorry, the, uh, the snooze so far? <laughs> if she's anything like me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, the alarm clock goes off at 10 a.m. UTC on, uh, on the 20th of January. So, so that's when uh, we start to wonder about the, the snooze button. But we'll be waiting for a signal. Um, the European Space Operations Center in Germany uh, will be hosting an event that day that uh, people can watch on live stream. And we will find out when the signal comes back from the spacecraft to say she's awake. That's cool. And so you're just going to broadcast videos in, in her general direction? So the winners of the, the contest, of the Wake Up Rosetta contest, um, two will be invited to come to uh, the Space Operations Center ESOC in Darmstadt for the landing of Thiele, the lander which will go uh, descend to the comet in November. Uh, and in the meantime as well, the, the 10 best videos will be uh, beamed out towards Rosetta to encourage her on the mission. And so what are the major operations that are going to happen this year? You mentioned the lander, the Philae lander. What are some of the other big events that people should be looking forward to after it successfully wakes up? So once a, the um, spacecraft actually wakes up, it has to go through a warm-up process and obviously check on the instruments, some of which we've already seen functioning through the flybys and the, um, the encounters with the asteroids, which is Steins and Lutetia. But of course, the last asteroid encounter was 2010. So uh, all of those instruments will be checked. And then the Philae lander itself wakes up in March. And then the uh, spacecraft goes on to track down uh, the comet itself, which will be happening in the summer. And uh, we've got some really nice videos on uh, www.esa.int if people want to see the animations of how all that happens and the special kind of maneuvers that the spacecraft has to do because it's not like going in orbit around a planet that has to go on this awkward kind of trajectory around the comet because it's, you know, the comet's a small thing. And then obviously staying with the comet as it gets closer to the sun and starts to become more active. And then the landing is scheduled for November. And then we'll see after that, um, it, would, it would have to last another six months to be able to see the comet go inactive again. So we'll, we'll see how it progresses. But really, like for the whole year, there's different stuff happening. So it's a great mission for people to get excited about and get involved in from early on. Yeah, I mean, uh, we talked about this last week with Emily Lakhtawala from the Planetary Society. Uh, you know, and I think this is going to be the highlight mission of the whole year, the, the, one that, the one that we can anticipate anyway. You know, we can't anticipate when Curiosity finds some fossil on the surface <laughs> of Mars. But, but you know, the, for the missions that we can anticipate, this is just going to be great, and I'm really, really excited about it. So, so just one last reminder then for people, if they want to participate in the contest, they want to help wake up Rosetta, what do they need to do? So if you come to the Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash Rosetta Mission, there are details there of how to enter the contest. But basically, you can do a Vine, you can do a YouTube, uh, put the hashtag Wake Up Rosetta on. And even if you're not seriously interested in winning the prizes, we'd really love to see your videos to off offer lots of support to the mission as well and keep reminding people about the excitement ahead because not everybody knows already. And, you know, I've been thinking back to Giotto when I was a little younger than I am oh, now yeah. and how inspiring that was in 1986. Yeah. So I really hope that. Uh, people who are of an equivalent age now in grade school can can see something as exciting this year. Terrific. Okay. Ruth, Ruth are we going to actually see uh, surface images from the Philae lander w when it's on the comet itself once it lands? Um, I'm not totally involved with all of the operations, oh, okay. but the Philae lander has its uh, has its cameras, and there's going to be then um, parts of the instruments are involved with communicating between the orbiter and the lander through the comet itself to be able yeah. to tell more about the interior. So there's a, a lot of beautiful stuff to come. I hadn't yeah. seen if there was actually a visual, like, standard camera on it, and I'm like, please tell me there's a camera on it. <laughs> 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 well, one of the things, like, people are so enthusiastic about being able to see Philae itself on the comet, but, of course, it's going to be cool. very small. So we've got to just watch it descend and then see what happens next. Now, I've got a question here from the, uh, from the viewers. This comes from uh, Mark Gillick. If the probe survives going around the sun on a comet and then heads back out into the outer solar system, will you still be able to communicate with it, and for how long? Oh, I'm sorry. I ha have to refer that to operations people. Okay, but I'll okay. make sure that we get an answer on Google Plus in the next day or so. 
Sure, but I know that, yeah, I mean, right now, the whole reason why you've had to keep it sleeping is because it's been so far away from the sun, hasn't been getting solar energy. Now it's closer with the sun, following the comet, it's going to get a chance to get some juice up its batteries, but it's still going to be on this orbit, so at some point it's going to head back out and then probably get back out into the... Yeah, and Cold there are other space. obstacles involving the amount of debris it's going to encounter once the comet becomes active as well. Yeah, amazing. Cool. Well, we're going to let you go. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sort of getting the word out, and uh, and I will encourage and nag everybody to uh, to send in those videos, and uh, and I think it's going to be great. So yeah, go ahead and put the links down in the event page, cool. and so people can go to Facebook and the hashtags and everything like that. Perfect. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes for the show as well. So thanks, Ruth, and thanks to the ESC team for getting back so quickly and and providing you at a moment's notice to to join us for the space hangout. I, yeah, that's very cool. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. I look forward to seeing your videos. Awesome. Oh, I've got to do a video. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, we'll do, we'll, no, we'll do we're a shooting video. this week, so maybe yeah. we will do a video for you. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cheers. Right. See you later. All right. Uh, yeah. So the big news this week. How awesome was that? Issa just that dropped in cool. to talk with us. Man, that's so great. I love the internet. Um, okay, so the big news, of course, is that it was the American Astronomical Society meeting in Washington, D.C., and and if you're a science space journalist, this is Christmas, I guess? <laughs> Your birthday? It, it, it's like it's like all of them it involved was, slamming at you in five minutes. And yeah. Like, it, it was it was East, Eastern Orthodox Christmas this week anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I can recall, um, man, it must have been four years ago, I went to my first AAS meeting. It was the one in Austin. And, okay. uh, and I was the only one from Universe Today, and uh, and you show up in there, and they give you like a pile of press releases, and they're like, "Here's what we're going to be talking about." Okay. And then in addition to that, <laughs> you know, it's like, and each one is like amazing. You're like, "Planets discovered, dark matter maps." And so it's crazy. And then they have all of these press conferences. So you're trying to attend these press conferences, and you're trying to report on this news. And we actually realized quickly early on that being at the AAS <laughs> is the worst place to be to try and digest this news. And so what we ended up doing was having a person there on the ground um, who was sort of, sort of seeing what the big news was, but then people back home in the nice, comfortable offices reporting on the news. So, mm -hmm. uh, so nobody here went to AAS, right? Nope. Perfect. I've never been to one. Have yeah, they ever been I have one? Different in... Perspective. It's it is just bombardment. Yeah. You know, I, I was there last year. I presented some research from um, from the, using Virtual Star Party for outreach efforts, and oh, it was there's just so much going on, and you really need to have a plan of action like a week ahead of time. You know, plan out your days to the minute on where yep. you're going to be, where you're going to go, because if you don't. You're in this whirlwind of awesome chaos, and you have no idea what you're going to do. Surrounded by all of your heroes. It's, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my method with this was, like, I was forcing myself to write an article every two hours that had, you know, that, that was the thing that was most interesting to me at the time, and whether it was a press release thing or whether it was just something I was stumbling into and discovering. So, yeah. So let's just talk about the AAS now that it's sort of done. What was the big... What would you guys say was the big news story for, for this week? Oh, there's so much. There was a lot about black holes and X-ray astronomy that I saw. At least I, yeah. I kind of put a wish list together when Nancy said, hey, who wants to cover these? And I took like an article a day for this week. So uh, that's that's what I saw. A lot right. of astrophysics stuff. Yeah, yeah. So so why don't we talk about... Um, well, you worked on a, the gamma ray gravitational lens. Yes, I did. That, that, that came out on Monday, and that was a release out of uh, the Fermi Observatory that actually, when they say seen, it's kind of, when, once you read into it, it's like, okay, it's more like detected because Fermi doesn't really have the resolution that we think of in optical astronomy to see. But they actually managed to uh, get some time on the Fermi Space Telescope, and they detected a blazar. Uh, that has a phone number-like name as its right ascension declination is uh, B0218 plus 357. It was uh, 4.35 light years away, and this was due to a, uh, a gravitational lens that was uh, 4 billion light years away that was just in front of it. And this actually has the closest arc second separation of about a third of an arc second. That's 
something I understand a little more as far as a visual backyard astronomer when they start talking about positioning and things like that. It's like, okay, now I have a grasp on what you're talking about. It's interesting they exploited something called the, the delayed playback effect to actually see this. And Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, but it actually has something to do with uh, relativistic beaming where the, gravi the uh, gamma rays were arriving at a slightly different time than the visual light. They were yeah. seeing through Hubble and these other observations, they, this, this is a known gravitational lens. This gravitational lens uh, was known of before. So Fermi's kind of staring off in this direction with its one or two degree arc, uh, field of view, looking for this delayed playback effect it, where uh, the blazar is, uh, is, is brightening up in gamma rays. And the, the gamma rays arrive here actually 11 days after the visual light and the x-rays and everything are arriving here because it's leaving, the blazar is an active galactic nuclei where you've got a black hole feeding off the core of the galaxy that's way in the background from this face-on spiral. And the gamma rays are leaving from a slightly different part of that blazar, and they're going through a different part of the gravitational lens, hence they're arriving here 11 days late. So Fermi was seeing this 11-day flash in behind what other observatories were seeing when they got time on it last September to actually observe. The big de detection, they said in the AAS, the next thing to, to do would to actually have Fermi or some gamma ray observatory find a gravitational lensing system on its own, to say pointing off in a direction that there's something interesting, we're getting this kind of uh, blazar flash off in this direction, and then have another observatory actually back that up. Is uh, And so this is the first time that, that gamma rays have been... A gravi by, by a gravitational yeah, lens? Yeah, the take home from this is the first time they've seen a, a gravitational lens that they've detected it in gamma rays. So, the, again, it's a known gravitational lens. Maybe during the next AAS we might hear a report of a gravitational lens being discovered in gamma rays would be the next logical step for this. I think it's amazing when you think about these gravitational lenses. I mean, they give you this extra power to look way further into the universe than you would with just the telescope alone. It's like Mother Nature has provided us with a whole bunch of these super telescopes. I mean, whenever you hear about these galaxy discovered at the furthest distance, shortly after the you know the the Big Bang and stuff, these are all uh, you know these lenses that are that are being being u utilized. It's just like a natural telescope sitting out there. It's amazing. There is an observational challenge called Einstein's cross. I've never seen it, but if you have a very large telescope, I know I've, I've heard of some amateurs saying they've managed to detect portions of it. That is a gravitational lens you can see from your backyard with a big telescope. Wow, that's crazy. Never uh, seen it. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. So, uh, Brian, you've got a story about the new triple star system detected. Yeah, there's a, a, a three-star system that was detected. It was announced in Nature. It is particularly interesting because it has a millisecond pulsar. It has a neutron star that happens to be pulsing in our direction, so we see it as a pulsar. And that is orbiting with a white dwarf. And the, the orbital radius of, of the white dwarf and the neutron star, I think, are around 15 times the distance of the Earth to the moon. So they're extraordinarily close. And then at about the distance from the sun to the Earth, is another white dwarf that's orbiting the pair. So you've got this very close trinary system that has two white dwarfs and a neutron and a neutron star, a pulsar, all together, which is, you know, extraordinarily providential. And so, like, what would the... I'm trying to think about, like, what the, the situation must, must have been. I mean, you've got all these white dwarfs now, so what must it have looked like in the past? We don't know. It, it's, <laughs> it's a very young system. It's It's unusual in how it's constructed. It's it's just an unusual system, and and we're not entirely sure how it formed that way. Brian, I, I think this is the one that other news sites, not Universe Today, of course, was saying this was going to debunk Einstein's theory of relativity, this discovery. It's, Einstein was wrong! What? <laughs> well, it's interesting because it, it will test the fundamental idea yeah. of general relativity. Yeah. The, there's, there's something known as the equivalence principle, which we typically see as things fall down at the same rate. So if you take a, a bowling ball and, and a Nerf ball, they will fall at the same rate, ignoring air friction. And Right, like the, the feather and hammer on the, on the moon. Yes, right. the hammer and the feather on the moon is, is, is the classic example. Um, and we've done this type of test. It's known as the Edbos experiment. And, and we've done different type of materials, and they all seem to fall at the same rate. And 
we assume that that's true for general relativity to be true. It's a fundamental idea of general relativity. But everything that we've done, if you say feathers, baseballs, bowling balls, they're all structurally atoms. They're all essentially the same type of thing, of the same type of density. They're, they're, they're different, but they're not that different. The reason why this system is particularly useful is that you have a, a white dwarf, which is basically held by electron pressure, and then you have a neutron star, which is so dense it's made basically of just neutrons. It's like the nucleus of an atom. And they're orbiting each other. This other white dwarf is attracting the two of them. Now, if the equivalence principle is true, then those two inner stars, the white dwarf and the neutron star, should be affected by the gravity of the outer white dwarf in the same way. They should be pulled in the same way based only on their distances and stuff. If the equivalence principle is not true, we should be able to see some difference between how a white dwarf attracts a neutron star versus how it attracts a white dwarf. That's the key, because we've never been able to test it with such radically different materials. Um, and so it's, it's not going to prove it wrong, necessarily, but it will allow us to test it. We'll either confirm it to a higher degree of precision than we've ever done, or we'll find something new, and then all the theorists go, yay! <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, they know that there's a few of Einstein's predictions that have that have held out right even till now. But they're sort of right. now they're fine tuning the things like frame dragging and the gravitational um, gravitational waves and the leakage of energy as gravitational waves and things like right. that. And you get these situations with these millisecond pulsars. They're just so precise that it's the yep. perfect place to make these tests. So this is great. Right. I yeah. started seeing articles after that came out, that press release that said, triple s system discovered, Einstein debunked? You know, so it's... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's but, but there are other alternatives to general relativity. There are string models, for example, that have deviations from general relativity that we might be able to see here. If, they're, if they exist, this is the type of system that we need to test it. Right, and it's just so, you know, with physics in general, we need, we need to find a way to... You know, unify. You know, we have gravity as this one force, but all the other forces they don't play well together. So there's more right. we need to figure out with it. So these, yep. these, you know, all these extra um, observations, and we're able to more fine tune our understanding the way these forces work. So debunking Einstein, that's, you know, <laughs> sensationalized headline is sensationalized. That's, that's linked link Well, but right. I get, I mean, I get so many, I get emails, I get press releases that are, Einstein was wrong. Mostly it's some, some crackpot writing a theory, and for some reason right. they want to they want to send the Einstein was wrong email. I'm sure right. you all get them as well. And, yeah. But that's the thing about science is you're, always fine-tuning it. You're always getting more information to get a more accurate representation of what's happening in nature. So right. saying that he's wrong is <laughs> completely inaccurate in what science is trying to accomplish. My, my money's on Einstein. Even when he was wrong, he was right. So. <laughs> <laughs> like with the cosmological yeah, constant yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah that so guy is just never wrong. Who's never wrong? That's the other thing about these theories is that when Einstein proved Newton wrong, Newton is still as right as it ever was. Right. When, if we prove Einstein wrong, Einstein is still as right as it ever will be. It's just that we can push beyond it. We can go to the next level and be more precise at different levels. Right, exactly. All right, so Scott, uh, you've got a really cool tool that's being developed for people who are visually impaired. So they can see Yes, it. I don't have it personally. You don't have um, it? I don't. You it have is, information on it. You have secret I, knowledge of I, it. Oh, it's not secret. It was in the, the press release of, of AAS. Um, so the, the folks at the Space Telescope Science Institute with Hubble, they, and this would have been helpful for me two years ago, but uh, they're developing an iBook and also these, uh, these plastic tools that are giving 3D representations of uh, celestial bodies, which is great for the visually impaired. And so they're using 3D printers. They got a grant with the Hubble, uh, with the Hubble Telescope uh, grant for education public outreach, and they're 3D printing representations of these celestial bodies. So we're talking, uh, you know, about nebulae and star systems and clusters, and it's just such a great way to be able to oh, cool. communicate astronomy to those that can't, you know, visually see it. Uh, I had a, a student uh, about a year and a half ago that was blind in the planetary astronomy class, and trying, you know, trying to get him to understand the the celestial sphere was so difficult. Because how do you communicate that? And so I I, I ended up taking a uh, a hamster ball 
and making um, like tacky glue on there so we can feel it around what we're talking about with the sphere, but having a way of seeing the details of Hubble images and this 3D representation is awesome. Uh, so it's uh, Carol Christensen is uh, one of the, the main outreach scientists, the outreach uh, astronomers from SCSI, and there's just more of these coming out, and I love how they're using 3D printing to, to develop further ways of, of broadening education and public outreach for astronomy. It's something that, you know, we rely upon light to understand the universe, and for the segment of the population that cannot naturally see light, we're still finding a way that we can interpret this light in two different ways so they can still understand what's going on. Could you imagine, like, getting your hands on a 3D model of, like, the Orion Nebula? Like, but right. an actual 3D representation of what it of what might actually look like. I mean, I think we would all understand and appreciate cool. it a lot more if we could even just sort of get a sense of, of what the thing looks like in three dimensions. Uh, there's those great animations uh, that, that, oh man, I forget his name. He's from Finland and he does these wonderful 3D versions of 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 some of the uh, some of the objects like nebulae and and uh, clusters and stuff like that and they just right. look terrific when you can you can start to see the different layers and how these these different regions are interacting with each other that it's not just this flat image in the sky it's a 3D object that we're seeing from a perspective so yeah, that's a that's a that is I think a fantastic right. idea I can't wait I'll screen to share so. craters, yeah I'll screen share something real quick to show off what what they're able to do uh, let's see here. So yeah, there's the, the 3D modeling on here from it being printed out. And so they're able to feel the, the, these hot spots, these really bright spots. Um, and, they, and also where they're having the keys. So they letting people you know, know what they're seeing and what type of texture on here is representing what as you're going through the different models. And I, I can't wait for even more of these to come out because they're fantastic teaching tools, not only for the visually impaired, but not all of us learn the same way. And so being right. able to think about, you know, think about space is really hard to naturally thinking about it in three dimensions. Because you look up and you see a bunch of points or you see this, you know, this beautiful 2D picture, but now you're able to think about its structure in a way that you don't typically think about it. And I, I'm really excited about this. This is a great way of really branching out on not only for the visually impaired, but for those of us that don't, you know, really learn the same way. Uh, I know I I'm very tactile the way I learn. So being able to to really visualize that in my mind just by touching it is awesome. That's just terrific. Uh, okay, so uh, David, we've got uh, death by black hole. Yeah, this came out of uh, University of Alabama and NASA researchers. Also, uh, were working on a competitive team. Uh, the University of Alabama team was led by Peter Maxim. And this was a interesting discovery looking at the archival data from the Chandra survey. They looked at a, a particular galaxy that was designated uh, from, it was a certain survey known as WINGS. It was WINGS J1348. And this is off in the Abel 1795 cluster in the constellation Bootes uh, in the northern sky. So this galaxy is very faint. Uh, Chandra actually managed to catch a rare tidal X-ray flare in this galaxy looking back through the, and they hadn't caught this until they looked through the archival data looking back at it. So this is just an interesting, what they think the best model fit for this is actually this was an intermediate mass black hole gobbling a star in a dwarf galaxy. Now intermediate black uh, mass black holes are, are the semi-missing link as far as uh, between uh, small black holes, stellar mass black holes, and supermassive black holes like in the core of our galaxy. Intermediate mass black holes are generally uh, considered about 100 solar masses to a million solar masses. At least that's what the Wikipedia entry on intermediate mass black holes says uh, when I was researching the article. This galaxy, Wings J1348, is 800 million light years distant. Uh, again, it's in the constellation Bootes, and they think that there may be more uh, intermediate mass black hole uh, incidents like this and X-ray flares out there in the Chandra data that they haven't caught yet. So this is an interesting case of actually looking back through the data, seeing something we hadn't seen before. And they said there was also possible, but this would be even more bizarre, and they don't think the observations fit this, that it could be an, uh, a galaxy supermassive black hole in a dwarf galaxy that just nicked a star. But again, that would be even more bizarre, and they said that uh, the research doesn't really bear that out. 
Uh, so this gives us a little more insight as far as what can be pulled out of archival data and looking at intermediate black mass black holes and trying to understand this kind of missing link between stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. Well, there's something recent going on right now, which is that in the Milky Way, there's a blob, be it a gas, you know, blob of gas or a star. That. Yeah, that's actually yeah. going to be impacting with the supermassive black hole. The supermassive hole. black hole at the core of our galaxy. Yeah, you know? and... Yeah, the, and so the question is, was that just gas, like a blob of gas? Like Other astronomers think that it actually was a star, that the shape of it, its orbit, that it is actually a star that's gotten torn apart. And, uh, yeah, that, that is uh, Sagittarius A star at the core of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I believe that's yeah. it's a couple hundred million, correct me if I'm wrong, mass, solar mass black hole? No, it's four, four million? Four million, I think. Yeah, four million. Oh, it's just, four a, million. just a bait. Just, just a baby, a baby. yeah. No, the word, the biggest one is like a trillion times the mass. No, a billion times the mass of the sun. I think yeah, that's like an M eighty one. I think has a really yeah, like a big one. yeah elliptical galaxy. So, so I mean, this is great. I mean, so we're going to see this collision at the supermassive black hole shortly, and and then we're going to see the burst of energy, and maybe that can really help with this process. So, so I mean, this is the big question, right? Where do where did these supermassive black holes come from? Did they form first? Did the galaxies form first? And why are there no none of these intermediate ones? You you would think they're going to be there in the smallest dwarf galaxies, they, or maybe at the cores of uh, of globular clusters. And uh, <laughs> and yet, where where are they? So it's a when, it's a it's a when, it's a crazy mystery. On on another article I worked on when I talked to J Daniel Stern at uh, JPL, he was saying that the new star uh, X ray observatory is also going to be giving us some some uh, better looks at Sagittarius A star in the core of our galaxy because that mm -hmm. that has an unprecedented resolution and that looks at a very high energy hard X ray spectrum right. that uh, Chandra uh, Chandra and the XMM uh, European Space Agency Space Telescope it, it doesn't cover that region of the spectrum. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Scott, you, of course, are very knowledgeable about the Frontier Fields, and uh, they did a big presentation of Frontier Fields at AAS. They did. They, a huge press release. Um, there's a new, I guess, a, a little two-minute uh, preview, I guess, uh, narrated by uh, Dr. Frank Summers that's on YouTube, which is really, you know, it gives the understanding of what Frontier Fields is, which I think is the best way of hacking science. And okay, give people the overview. Like what? Like when we hear frontier fields, because we're going to hear a lot of this. You're going to hear a lot of it. It's yeah, going to be awesome. So, so when someone says, "Like what is this frontier fields?" So what are they seen, doing? Like the the ultra deep field, which is Hubble looking out into, into this blank area of the sky and seeing further and further than we've ever seen. But we've hit a wall, but we're able to see, which is why we have James Webb going up and stuff like that. But what astronomers are doing now is they're using the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, and Chandra as well, all three of these um, of the great uh, orbiting observatories, and looking out into these fields which have a gravitational lens. So we have this large amount of dark matter, spooky, that is there and it, it's being used as a lens. So what's going on is the the space uh, the space time around it's being warped. So the the light's going through because dark matter does not interact with light the way that normal matter does. And they're using this bending and warping of space-time as a way to look further back than they've been able to before. So they're hacking science in the way that, well, we have this limit, but now we can use this awesome phenomena of nature that we don't really know much about yet, but we're going to use it anyway because we know enough about it to use it and to look even further back into space and time. I and love, the thing I love about dark matter is that we have no idea what it is, but we're perfectly happy to use it as a telescope. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, we, like what, who knows what it is, but it makes a great telescope. You know? It, it, but, are we, it, but we we learn more about it in the process of using it, too, which I think yeah. is phenomenal. So, like, we might not know a lot about it, but we're able to use it as a twofer. We're able to look further back than we've been able to, but we under, we'll be able to understand it more the more we use it. And mm -hmm. since it's achromatic, we're able, you know, we don't have to worry about the light being distorted too much with it, because it dark matter does not affect the light. It affects mm -hmm. the space. And so everything's going to be fine, so we're going to be able to see the red shifting that's going on as well. And I just, it's such a perfect tool to use after the, after Hubble's been up for 25 years, 20, yeah. and we just found a new way to look even further back. I I love this thing, and we uh, a new uh, a new article just went up like 
half hour ago on frontierfields.wordpress.com about the different parallel fields that uh, that they'll be doing. We're having six parallel fields where they'll be doing some long-term observing, and this will be up for the next five years, and looking at two side-by-side -side patches to get these long exposures in the, the near-infrared and the optical wavelengths because we have the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, but we want to see sampling from across the sky. And so uh, the astronomers there are just getting a bigger selection of seeing, is the universe like the ultra deep field at just that spot? Do we get lucky? Or is it you know, all across the sky when we look out? So right. there's, there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff coming out in the years to come with Hubble, with Chandra, and Spitzer, and then you know Gaia and James Webb. I mean, just all this awesome stuff coming up, and we're we're using these these tools that inspired these new generation of astronomers in new ways that you never thought would be able to. Uh, now, so we are literally just uh, scratching the surface of what went down at AAAS. Uh, there's one, I don't know if you guys saw this, uh, it was about uh, a star they found, a red giant, I think it's a red giant star, that appears to have a neutron star that it ate. And so there's a neutron star at the core of this red giant star, which is, which is really cool. Ian reported on this. I did catch the bit about the Gemini Planet Imager uh, showed first light. They had a, a pretty good image of uh, Beta Pictoris B, which had been discovered before, but they'd never seen it in this kind of resolution. I, I wrote about that for a different site. Yeah, I, a, like an actual photograph of an exoplanet. Um, yeah. And then just some really terrific images from Hubble and from some of the other telescopes. So, so I mean, we could do a five-hour version of this show. So I think we'll, we'll, we will move on to something that has nothing to do with the AAAS, um, and that is the fact that the International Space Station will be let, allowed to live. Amy. Yay, it's alive. <laughs> it's alive. <laughs> uh, yes, this week uh, the Obama administration has okayed the International Space Station to continue operations through to 2024, which is four years longer than it was previously um, meant to be kept alive. So this is, this is good for the obvious reason that it keeps the ISS going and it gives us this test bed to use, or to test rather, technologies that will be used in future manned spaceflight programs and other sort of, um, you know, any other technologies. The most immediate of which is sort of this famous manned mission to an asteroid we keep hearing about that's supposed to happen sometime around or by 2025. Um, keeping the ISS um, up and running until 2024 will make sure that NASA doesn't have a gap in its space flight programs and will really give the agency time to test everything that it needs to see this mission through if it does happen. Um, I'm still the skeptic, obviously. <laughs> um, and and the, other, the other thing in terms of sort of immediate space uh, goodness is that it, it it will still be there for uh, companies like SpaceX and all these other commercial spaceflight providers to practice and really hone their ability to get uh, men and cargo up into low Earth orbit, which you know should free up NASA to focus on other things like the SLS if that ever gets going, <laughs> or any of the other big things that the agency is sort of planning. Um, but there are other benefits of the ISS to kind of keeping it up and running because we don't talk about it all the time. Um, I should find a link for this right now, but the NASA always puts out this, this spin-off technologies booklet thing every year, and the amount of technology that you don't know came from NASA that's tested on the ISS or approved on the ISS, there's so much really cool stuff going on, so it's actually really great to have the ISS up and running for another four years because we don't know what kind of spin-off technologies we're going to get that are going to make all of our lives better in the, the future. So, um... I assume Fraser is putting up the link to the article I wrote today because it has some some more details. I don't want to get into all of it, but um, there there is a um, you know from from NASA technology that's been tested on the ISS. There are um, air air scrubber technologies that actually keep operating rooms sterile. Um, and that technology can actually also be applied into materials to make self-cleaning surfaces. Like, that's really cool and, you know, wouldn't have happened without the ISS. Um, their scientists are developing potential vaccines for salmonella, another antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria. That's really cool and happening on the ISS. And other weird things, like... Um, an architect who is working with NASA to develop a habitat module for astronauts, taking into account the fact that, you know, three-dimensional space matters when you're in zero gravity, and also international means that, every, you know, uh, representatives from different nations and cultures who use space differently have to be comfortable, um, brought all of this NASA-based knowledge into developing a really awesome off-the-grid camper. 
Um, so mm -hmm. these technologies that you can take into the wilderness and sort of connect with our own planet were developed for use off the planet. Um, so there's all kinds of really interesting things that go along with the ISS, not just in space, not just space-based stuff, but that comes back for all of us. So having the ISS up and running is pretty pretty good. There's Look the, forward uh, to seeing what, what there, else spins there, off. <laughs> there's the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer, too. That's a, a great astrophysics experiment that's based on the, can only be based on the yeah. ISS, as a matter of fact. Yep. And well, I, I the like the, uh, <clears throat> they've just recently attached the, uh, the Earth Cam the EarthCast, sorry, a camera to the International Space Station. This is going to give a live streaming view of the surface of the Earth that's steerable from this, uh, you know, from this, the space station, which yeah. is pretty great. It's also a great launch platform for launching satellites in that they just, you know, huck them over. <laughs> they <laughs> toss them over. Open the window and they just toss them over. Yeah. Yeah, throw a satellite. So, you, you know what we're going to need, though, is we have 10 years to one-up Chris Hatfield, do we need a four-man band up on the ISS? <laughs> there you go. That's a cool yeah. idea. He really scratched the surface oh, yeah. of what kind of music can be produced in space. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I mean, Chris Hatfield was, I think, one of the, the biggest highlights of 2013 involving the ISS as far as outreach goes. And I see a lot of people in the, the comments who were talking about stargazing live because he was just on that in, in BBC. But, yeah, there's so much that can be done with the ISS as far as you know science goes. Some great science is being done up there, but also it's a great way of connecting all of humanity and seeing what we can share. And, and the fact that we have you know the Russians, Japanese, and Americans and Canadians and this huge representation of our awesome race up there working together and finding ways of getting people inspired about science, I think is really great. I think, I think, the, I think the Russians are doing some long duration one year missions starting next year too. Yeah. Well, so yeah, I mean, you know, my opinion, the the best, the, the, the reason you should have a space station of some variety is to learn how to live in space and not die. And I think that, <laughs> you know, and, like, and, and as you yeah. said, you got to test each one of these things. Like, you know, can we eat in space? Can, can, how long can we last? I mean, you know, does, what happens if you're old? What happens to your muscles? What happens to your bones? What are the different kinds of, you know, if you're not exposed to certain, or what about the radiation? What about the nutrition? What about reclaiming water? I mean, it just goes on and on. The list of things that you need to figure out to just not die is is so important, and that is the future of, of us becoming a spacefaring civilization. I mean, how are we going to, when you think about the people going all the way to Mars on these Right. And, and living there permanently. Um, you're going to have to have more than David Bowie covers. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need at least a four-man band. Like some kind of great big 13-piece right. punk orchestra is what I think. I think. So, um, okay. Well, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. But, it, you know, at the same time, very, very expensive. Could yeah. they figure that stuff out on the ground without having to spend all that money? Um, yes. I think they could. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's move on. So... Uh, just today, and we don't have anything on this, is the launch of uh, Spaceship Two. Just did its uh, first powered supersonic flight, and there's just a few yeah. pictures have come out, and it's super exciting. Uh, and then when the second thing. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. When did, when are they gonna have uh, journalists fly on it? <laughs> well, yeah. didn't you're, was, you're was, was right, Alan, you're, you're, wasn't you're Alan that right? kind of bogarted his way into getting a test flight? <laughs> oh. Alan is yeah. He's got man. his and N this NBC link. So yeah, he's yeah. got he's got serious cred. Yeah, Alan's yeah. good people though. Yeah, if they need anybody to go standby. They're they're gonna yeah. want full seats. It's true. Yeah, and you're and I think you're you know you're Air Air Force right? So you've yeah I would, you've been I there. Would go, I would go camp out there to, just to go standby. Yep. They they hinted that they might that if so for some reason somebody can't do it that they would they're, they're probably going to they're probably going to want those first flights to go full I would think so if somebody yeah. I know yeah. there a lot of celebrities have signed up but if they decide just not to show up or whatever you know yeah. I don't know who would do that <laughs> who knows all right well I will I will send you forth as our representative David <laughs> better you than me <laughs> uh, I'll wait till it's happened a little more. Um, okay, so next thing is we had the uh, the the Antares launch just uh, yes. last night, right? There was a launch out of Wallops, yeah, yesterday afternoon, uh, East Coast time here, right past 1 p.m. I was watching that. They actually delayed for a few days. First, they delayed for the polar vortex, and then because uh, the temperatures were too cold there to to launch, and then they delayed for the uh, incoming solar storm uh, that, that was above the uh, radiation flux that was safe for them to launch. But they had a pretty flawless launch yesterday, Orbital Sciences. It went off. Uh, I didn't hear any hitches from when I was listening. I was kind of half listening and watching while I was writing yesterday. 
Uh, so it put up the Cygnus cargo spacecraft going after the ISS. It is going to capture in dock uh, this Sunday on January 12th at 11.012 UT, which is, well, that's early Sunday morning. I don't know if we'll be up then. 6.02 uh, a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I might be up to watch that. Uh, it's about seven minutes behind, so if you have an ISS pass, I encourage you to watch a few minutes before or after. I have seen a spacecraft oh, like Cygnus. Cool. You, you will be able to see it as a fainter star probably, and in this weekend it's going to be getting closer. I haven't looked to see if there's any good North America passes yet this weekend, but I'll probably be doing that right after I get off here. And the booster is still up there too. The uh, Antares rocket booster, will be. you may see that trailing as well. They'll probably re-enter over the next week. They're bringing up some CubeSats up there uh, that are going to be dispensed later on in the mission from the ISS, like we were talking about, where they just kind of toss them overboard. I think they have an automated dispenser that they kind of, so they don't actually have to do it. They have released CubeSats on spacewalks before, but I believe they have a way that they can just, uh, like, remotely deploy them. CubeSats are cool. awesome. Some kind of catapult. <laughs> like a there, is, are so sure, cool. there is one. I forget the name. I want to say it was Sky or, or uh, SkySat that is going to actually be interesting for amateur satellite watchers because it's going to deploy a large Mylar balloon, kind of like NanoSail D, to kind of test its uh, ability to end its life purposefully. That's one thing they want to do with a lot of these satellites is have something built into the satellite so it can re-enter rather than stay up there for years after its useful mm -hmm. life. So this is going to inflate this large couple meter mylar balloon that's going to create more atmospheric drag to cause it to re-enter. But uh, amateur satellite observers, most CubeSats we can't see because they're like this big. But this one will actually be big enough and reflective that amateur sat spotters should be able to see it. So that will be kind of interesting there in the coming months. Um, fantastic. And the other sort of big big news or the big thing event that's happening right now is that Venus is approaching inferior conjunction. Yes, it is. Tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact. Let's see if I can screen share this without deleting. You're going to give it a complex. Inferior? What do you mean inferior. by that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is inferior conjunction is when Venus is passing between the Sun and the Earth. You might remember last time we had inferior conjunction was a big deal because Venus was transiting the Sun. And it was However, hot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we missed it here. Actually, I got I, I got a very probably the very worst image ever taken worldwide of the transit of Venus through the clouds. Very briefly here. Is a, I had the same. Story. I know. I think we could put I, up our images and they would battle. I, I did see it, but it was like for ten seconds. I called oh. the wife over to take a look through the scope, and it was gone. So yeah, I think that was one of our highlights of for doing hangouts. Was was that? that yeah, was yeah. So we, we covered the 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 transit of Venus live on as as a six hour Google Plus hangout on air. Oh man, it was crazy. It was so yeah, good. I you went to that. the you went to. I the, was in the desert. Like yeah, you're in the desert of San Diego, and yeah, with the yeah. Coronado P but, in a webcam, <laughs> right? Tethering so, my cell phone. You know, and as I'm sure people are wondering, if it's going to pass in front of the sun. And why won't we get another Venus transit? Well, Ven Venus's orbit is tilted about three degrees in relationship to the ecliptic, which traces out the path of the Earth's orbit. So usually it passes above and below. We won't get another transit till 2117 AD. So none of us, uh, if somebody's doing a space hangout, it will be our grandkids. We won't be here by then. I'll be on to my third one. <laughs> yeah, I'm living forever. forever. Yeah, or, I'm going to be a cyborg. Or we'll be like we'll Futurama. We'll, we'll be in the jars. Like yeah, it's in the jars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, it's, uh, but, but Sharon Ahmad over in Malaysia has been capturing some very awesome images that I'm screen sharing. Right uh, Shah is great. He is and, a monster. Yeah, Shah is the best. The, these are, uh, he, he is a professional at this. Don't try this at home because Venus is only, uh, when it's at inferior conjunction, it's going to be five degrees from the sun. That's only about 10 lunar yeah. diameters. I have seen it before. Uh, two uh, Venus cycles, we're talking eight-year Venus cycles ago, back when I was in Alaska, I actually visually caught Venus at about nine hours within inferior conjunction. And you can still do this tomorrow if you live in the high Arctic, which if anybody's listening out from Fairbanks or Iceland or something like that, because the angle of the ecliptic is so shallow when the sun is below the horizon, Venus is five degrees above the horizon. So you can still see this really razor-thin, sharp, like would you see it as it goes past the sun? Would you see that that yeah. that that illumination kind of run along the top of it and then you go would. to the other side? You would actually because it's moving into the morning sky. I mean, it yeah. would be doing it very slow. I mean, Venus is it's moving a few degrees a day. You can see Venus right now online if you go into uh, ESA Soho Observatory, oh, it's cool. NASA ESA. You can see uh, Venus moving through the Lasco C3. You know the camera we were all looking at when we saw Ison. We were watching yeah. Ison come around the sun. You can see Mercury moving out and Venus moving through inferior conjunction right now in the field of view of that camera. So. 
Yeah, and and and, and I mean the thing is, you got to be doing this actually during the day. Like all of Shaw's images now, he's doing these during the day. Yeah, he, so, he has he has the sun physically blocked somehow. I haven't. I'd like to talk to him and actually kind of expound on his safety precautions he's taking for his technique to to do that. But yeah, but don't yeah, lose an eye. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing that he can even image it that thin. As I'm I'm curious to see if he gets it tomorrow. I've been following on Google Plus to see if he gets it at inferior conjunction. Well, the great thing was we had the virtual star party on Sunday night, and and it Shaw awesome. and Paul Stewart joined us, and they're they were sort of viewing the sun and from the day, and uh, and Shaw showed his video. He's actually been recording video of Venus, and it was just fantastic. And then Paul. Shows him up and does it live, and yeah. so he brings us in a live view of Venus. Yeah, I saw that. Did, did, did you see our follow up on Twitter where Paul also got Mercury? Yeah, <laughs> so I, I challenged him to it. I, I told him I give him five space bucks, and so here <laughs> live on air, this is Paul's five space bucks that I made uh, just for him. Yeah, there and I go. challenge I challenge Shaw <laughs> to do a, a time lapse. So I said it would be really cool to see a time lapse cool. of. A Venus getting thinner and then switching around and then getting bigger again. I don't think so, we've had Mercury in the, in the virtual star party we were saying before. I think we've had it briefly. Yeah. I, don't, I don't recall, though. It might have been. Oh, we've had Pluto. Anyway, I'm, we're rabbit holing here. So let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Now, we've got a bunch of questions, so I just want to quickly cover these, and then we will let you all go. So the first thing, a bunch of people mentioned, uh, Ben Gaisley especially. In the UK, we just had three days of stargazing on BBC. Great guests. Commander Hadfield, Walt Cunningham, Carolyn Porco. Did any of you get to see it? No. We're, I'm Canadian. They're Americans. Did they stream that online anywhere? Um, if you have a VPN, you can watch it online. Yeah, you could um, pretend to live in the UK. I know my friends in the UK were, were talking about I mean, it was it was on when I was streaming, so I didn't I wasn't watching television. But I, I heard really good things from my friends in the UK about it. And I watched it last year. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, but, but what a civilized country to, like, on live television to take stargazing so seriously. Plus it's Darrow, Brian, and, and, yeah, and Brian Cox. I mean, all, and, yeah, Brian Cox. Yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah, no, that's just the best thing ever. I uh, I would love to participate in it. Pick me next year. Yeah, pick we'll, us. Pick us. We'll do a VSP from stargazing live. Yeah, we'll, we'll totally help out. Yeah. I think we'll be, we'll be great. Um... Uh, so it's a few other things. Guido Bieber notes that Emily Lockdwalla has dug up some new high-res Chang'e images. Chang'e. So, awesome. Emily Lockdwalla is the best. Um, Shivan Gupta asks, why do gamma rays originate from a different area than visible light? From where? Is this always the case? Or just in the case of a blazar? I'm going to throw that one to Brian. Oh, yeah. Please do. <laughs> well, I mean, the the... The gamma rays of the blazar are coming from really near where the black hole is. Basically, the black hole has this, got this jet, and, and when the jet's pointing in our direction, that's why we have a blazar. So it's very localized, whereas the visible spectrum can be more from the accretion disk or the surrounding area, and so you can get different locations that way. That's, that's kind of where... You and so you've really got to have that things lined up. You've got to you've got to be staring right down the barrel of the supermassive black hole, and then you've got to have that gravitational lens lensing right. in front of it, right, to give you that yeah. distortion of it from that just thing. So it's a real uh, cosmic. And just not only do you need to have these two objects lined up, but that galaxy has got to be turning towards turning towards you and, and yeah, blasting but, uh, the blazars, quasars, radio galaxies. Cepid galaxies are all related by the orientation of the galaxy itself. Uh, David, you're putting up the very, hand of the hand of very, God. Very, very quick. This was a new. This is a new uh, image out of the AAS from New Star. We, I mean, we've seen this hand of God image before, but this is as imaged by. This is New Star overlaid with the Chandra data, and I've, I've only got to say that if that's the hand of God, God is apparently a Simpson. Yeah, we're exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Don't. <laughs> exactly. But even on the Simpsons, on God the has Simpsons, five he has five fingers. Yeah. God has five fingers. That's right. God is the only character in all the Simpsons that has five fingers. Yeah. Nerd cred. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Holy moly! That three of us knew that. Okay. <laughs> I am. I. I'm so that is the hand of Homer. Overwhelmed with. That is. Uh, we could call it the hand of Homer then. The hand of Homer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we've already got the the Borg Homer. Nebula. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. Just remember, uh, all hate mail goes to Fraser. Yeah, yeah, all hate mail sent to me. Yeah, send me the hate mail. Uh, um, 
Uh, Jeff MacArthur asks, are gamma rays faster than the speed of light? I hear references to things like the Big Bang was faster than the speed of light. Is there anything that's faster than the speed of light? Again, Brian. Uh, gamma rays are not faster than the speed of light because gamma rays are light. Yep. Yeah, it they're is, just know, they're just another part of the spectrum. Wavelength of light, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah. then that's that's different than the inflationary period of the of the universe. But if nothing can move faster than the speed of light, Brian, how could the universe have expanded faster oh, than the speed of light? I've got this question before. <laughs> uh, well, this is gonna be a long hangout if we're gonna. Yeah, we can have a whole other hangout on yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> I can give you the quick answer. Uh, the universe itself can expand faster than the speed of light. Yeah, the, yeah, the expansion, on, right? the expansion can happen quicker. Yeah, moving on. Um, okay, here's a good question. Mark uh, Gillick asks, are there any gravitational lenses that, that lined up twice to make you, like, more powerful. So can you, so just imagine that, right? You could have a situation where you get oh, like a, a gravitational lens, lens and then another gravitational lens, and then I'm sure it's possible. I, I guess mean, it'd be possible. Space is unbelievably big. You know, I haven't, I haven't heard of one ever being detected, but yeah. I guess that would be possible. Yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible. Like a, okay. like a double. Well, but also think about it too: is anywhere you go in three dimensions, you can find two things that line up. Right. So. Yeah. It, yeah, th there's going to be two things that line up, whether we're in the right place to see it with but, our tools. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that a gravitational lens isn't quite the same thing as an optical lens. Right. So, so stacking lenses optically, you can get a bigger magnification, but uh, stacking yeah. gravitational lenses wouldn't necessarily give you a bigger image. Right. right. Uh, Tom Nathy has noted uh, that you need an 18-inch size telescope to see Einstein's cross and a 24 inch would be better and pristine seeing. So Oh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I've heard of amateurs seeing it, uh, but I've never seen it myself. So Right, with their 18 inch yeah, amateur giant, telescope. Bazooka They're telescopes, yes. Um, I saw it on the internet. Okay, so uh, <laughs> must be true. Must be true. Sam, <laughs> Sam Heron asked, and let's just do a show of hands here. Do you think that this universe is a simulation? Everyone who thinks this universe is a simulation, put up your hand. I don't think so. If it is, we're not in control of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. What a, whoever did the programming on this simulation needs to <laughs> go back and debug. It's buggy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I, the idea is fa is absolutely fascinating, right? And of course. And, yeah, and it's this idea that I'll give you the quick version because we don't have a lot of time. The idea is that that right now we are making better and better computer simulations and so you can imagine in the near future we will we will eventually be able to simulate a, a human mind multiple human minds further down the road you can imagine us simulating essentially a universe with lots of sentient creatures within that uni simulate within that simulation after that you can imagine we're going to be creating many simulations millions of simulations all at the same time so then when you ask yourself am i in a simulation you consider the odds, and the odds say that you probably are in a simulation because there's going to be millions that's, of simula yeah, simulations. Yeah, a really sentient character in Sims 3, that's, and that's yeah. essentially what you're talking the about. The chances that's, are, the chances are that you are in the simulation is vastly out weighs the chance that you're that's not. There's actually a really good science fiction book by Greg Egan called Permutation City that okay. talks about just this idea. Yeah, that's, that's well, one of the brains in jars. That's yeah. one of the possible answers to Fermi's paradox is we don't find aliens because they're all in their simulated universe and they don't care about reality anymore. Yeah. So right. They just say, keep the power on. They all discovered Twitter and now they're never yeah. going away. Yeah. <laughs> just, just keep the power on, yeah. Well, have, have any of you tried the Oculus Rift? No. no. No? So I've tried an Oculus Rift out and just keep the power on. I'll see you guys later because it, <laughs> yeah. it is amazing. Like, shut up and take my money. Um, 100 frames per second, 135 degree field of view, very low latency. It is, it is the next best thing to being there. So, awesome. Yeah. So as soon as these things come out, I, I definitely recommend you all try one out. And, and then you can decide if you want to jack into the simulated <laughs> universe and, and call it a day on this, this boring reality. So. <laughs> cool. Well, so I think we can... Fraser. <laughs> I'm gonna. Which pill? Red yeah. pill? Which is the one that lets you stay? Because I'm gonna keep <laughs> Okay, so we know the Simpsons, but not the pills. Yeah. <laughs> so take red, I'm sure the blue pill, red pill. Wait, I'm gonna take the one that lets me stay. All right. Now I'm gonna ask people where they can find out more about our team of journalists. Amy, your title. Uh, you this can is find your me. life. This is my life. Simulated <laughs> life. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter as AST Vintage Space uh, or Facebook or Google Plus as my name, and um, my blog Vintage Space is at uh, Popular Science and elsewhere. So, but those are good places to start. Anything interesting happening soon? That you can talk Not about? Not that I know of off the top of my head. Okay. That's not a good answer. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> All right, no problem. Brian will have a much better answer. Brian Koberlein. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Google+. Plus. Uh, that's where mostly I live, um, also on Twitter. Basically, Google my name. You can find me everywhere. It's such an unusual name, um, but that's, that's kind of where I am. Uh, new things, I started a video series. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's little short videos. I've got one up, so it's a series of one. A series uh, of one. But the, uh, the second one has already been shot, so... Oh, that's great. What's the topic for the first one? Uh, it is... Uh, gosh, what was it? What was it? I watched it last night. Um, <laughs> How did I miss this? I can't remember what you talked hey, about. Hey, you don't uh, know what the topic is. Series. Hold on, let me just Google Series this. is no longer a planet. Yes. No, Pluto. And what's in a name? <laughs> and right. it, yes. It happened to Series before it happened to Pluto. And you had your cat meowing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I will totally check this out, and I will promote it. You... you See, when you people do things and you don't yeah. tell me, you have only yourselves to blame that I don't That's promote true. you. Okay? Is that all clear? All right. Got it. Dave Got Dickinson, it. where do we find out more? I am Astro Guys with a Z across all platforms. I was active this week on my own website, Listasaur, Canada.com, Universe Today, and I am writing a Another post on the mini moon, which we have the most distant full moon. Mini moon. Of, mini moon. We have the most distant full moon of 2014. Last month we had the most distant moon of 2013. So that is my next big post. Uh, I've already got approved through Nancy coming out next week. Now I looked in Wikipedia, and I couldn't see mini moon in there. How it, <laughs> even though that's where it belongs, because everyone knows since the dawn of time the mini moon. Hey, we got the references for it now. The mini moon is the uh, the full moon is, is for the the what's the, it the smallest full near, moon of the year. Near, near, knows. Ap near apogee, yes. Near, near apogee, most, and and near, when you look at Wikipedia, you can year. find supermoon. I find that really strange. Yeah, yeah. Super Obviously, moon, Wikipedia yeah. is wrong, yes. and somebody should fix it. <laughs> Scott Lewis, where do we find out more? Uh, Matt, knowthecosmos.com. On Twitter, I'm bald astronomer. Uh, let's see. Um, I am doing stuff with Hubble Space Telescope and the Outreach, Deep Astronomy on YouTube, Virtual Star Party on Sunday night, and then this Sunday, uh, before the, the Virtual Star Party, we're having a celebration on Google+, Plus for the Science on Google+, Plus community, for reaching 200,000 members in the community. We are the largest science community and the 10th largest community of all Google+. Plus. So Brian will be there, and we'll be, uh, and the, a lot of our moderators and curators will be there celebrating that. So it'll be huge. And I just found out in an email that we will be doing a Hubble hangout on Monday as well. We don't know the time cool. yet, but there will be another hangout with the Hubble Space Telescope. So I will put that out there as soon as I get all the details to find out what I'm doing on Monday. Perfect. <laughs> all right. Uh, cool. Well, as always, I am. Uh, publisher of Universe Today, um, doing lots of cool videos on YouTube, and uh, these things that we do. So, uh, great. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to the team for for joining us again and reporting on the news, and a big thanks to the European Space Agency for yeah. reaching out at the last minute. Don't and, Yeah, and sending us Ruth and and, uh, and helping promote the uh, Wake Up Rosetta. So, come on, wake up. Wake up, Rosetta. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> Alright, we'll see you all next week. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye.